Hey everyone, I'm Sean C. Davis and I am super excited to kickstart another season of live talk shows coming to us from the Certified Fresh Events community. Now, after a really fun first season, we've decided to do a little bit of shift, a little bit of rebranding. What was formerly Code Sandwich Hour is now Uptime FM. Super serious, five nines guaranteed, or, you know, I don't know, something like that. But but don't worry, we're, we're going to carry over some of the fun traditions we had with the Code Sandwich Hour. It's just... Uh, the main shift here is that we're going to try to focus each episode on one particular topic. And I'm really excited for this first episode and to welcome our special guest on stage in just a minute. His name is Knut Malver, who is the head of de developer relations at Sanity. I think I totally butchered his name. Uh, <laughs> he can he can correct me in a moment. But I'm, I'm super excited to chat with Knut today because... I feel like we've been running in similar spaces for the last several years, but really haven't had the opportunity to officially meet until about eh, 10 minutes ago backstage or so. And so, uh, like I mentioned, Knut works for Sanity, which is working hard to solve both developers and editors problems in the content space. And I'm currently working for Stackbit that is trying to do much of the same uh, in, in a slightly different way. And in fact, right now, Stackbit has this really tight integration with Sanity. And we may or may not get into that. I don't know. We'll see where this goes. We'll, we'll have some fun with the conversation. But first, let's get Knut on stage. Here we go. And welcome Hello. to the show, Knut. Thanks for uh, having Thanks for me. being here. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Very excited. And now I, I want to let you do a formal introduction and all of that. But first, uh, in, in the spirit of carryover from the Code Sandwich Hour season, I thought we would start with my favorite icebreaker question, which is, what is the best sandwich? What is the best uh, sandwich? Like, universally, not in my opinion, just like... No, in, in, your, in your opinion. I mean, opinion, okay. if, you, if you feel like um, you have an objective answer, I'll take that too. Like, but no, no, yeah, no, I did yeah, that Actually, no. Um, <laughs> I want to start off by being controversial. I would say a hot dog. Is a hot dog a sandwich? A hot dog. Yes, it a is. Hot dog. Uh, you know, I think that if we're going by the, I, I, I don't have it in front of me, but if we're going by that, like official um, Merriam-Webster's dictionary, I believe it says a sandwich is between two slices of bread or a split roll, and I feel like you could call a bun a split roll, and I feel like I'm. My personal opinion is I am more inclusive of um, what if something wants to be a sandwich, it can be a sandwich. That's fine. All right. That's fine. So, so hot dog. All right. <laughs> so, so um, now two questions for you. One is, do, is, is there like a specific brand or type of hot dog? And two is, what, do you dress or top it with anything? So, um, it might become more obvious uh, along this episode. I'm not from the U.S. I'm from this little place called Norway. And in Norway, there's this kind of tradition uh, of uh, gas station hot dogs. Sounds horrible, Amazing. maybe. Amazing. <laughs> but those, 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 yeah. And yeah, you, you do dress it with, um, I think the, like the standard is like uh, ketchup and mustard. And maybe okay. if you're feeling adventurous, some, 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 some onion on there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, I mean, I guess not, uh, not, not altogether different than the U S version of a hot dog. Probably not. But yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Well, <laughs> with, uh, with that controversial start to the season, let's, um, let's move on now. I want to, I want to talk content editing and, and like the whole content editing experience. Um, and, and we'll, we'll get into the weeds there, but I thought it would probably make sense to first start with a little bit of introduction so folks can get to know you. So can you um, tell us a little bit about yeah, who you are where you, and, and the work you do, and then specifically, what, where, where did you begin to get interested in or start working on content, content management for the web? Ooh, um, yeah, I think we have to, uh, to go back a while. I, I'm starting to get old now, I feel like. But yeah, I think it was like around 15. Uh, this is early 2000s. Um, we, we, we had stuff like Pentium computers and Windows 98. No, oh, no, Windows 2000, actually. Uh, XP, uh, v, like uh, FTP was a thing. Um, and okay. for some reason, I, I fell into this like, 
HTML markup language kind of thing, and I could put all websites on the internet. I think that's kind of like the the interest of content on the web started there by hand typing okay. stuff in in Notepad or something. Actually, it was front page. Interesting. I think. Yeah. Amazing. Um, okay, I I think I used yeah front page around there uh, around that same time. It's uh, we've we've come a long way, I'd say. <laughs> Or have we? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Or have we? Okay. So, um, <laughs> segue. Super open-ended question here. What if we if we now fast forward to today? What do you feel like is either the biggest or at least one of the biggest challenges that we have with managing content for the web today? Oh well, yeah. I think I think like we can continue to kind of like I started with like the handwriting HTML and so on. I think a lot of us also found this CMS thing called WordPress. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, like yeah, yeah. 10, 15 years ago, maybe, and and that really paved the way of letting people kind of like publish stuff themselves on on the web without having to code. Uh, and I think that shaped a lot of how we think about content on the web still today. Uh, sometimes maybe it holds us back. Um, and I think kind of like what we see now. Especially with new front end tools uh, like the Next.js's and the Gatsby's and Next and, and so on, is that we have this decoupling of, of presentation layer. Mm -hmm. uh, but we still haven't kind of figured out how to, well, what to do with that content and how to fit this nicely together in a way that makes sense and doesn't have HTML flying through the wires and stuff. So I would say kind of like figuring out like how should this presentation and kind of like content storage stuff actually work? Like you're doing that to yourself at Stackbit, right? So it's it's, it's a conundrum still for, uh, to many of us. Yeah, yeah, totally. I I think um and and one thing that I'm really interested in and and why I joined Stackbit is because I I kind of felt like we I first of all I think that the way you positioned it in so yeah, WordPress dates back to well, yeah, I don't know, like 04, 06, yeah. something yeah. like that. Something and like that. Yeah. and that 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 in large part defined this pattern for content management that we still use today, even though we have decoupled the front from the back. But I think what was really interesting in this move to to Jamstack, so to speak, or or the, this decoupled composable architecture is that we kind of left the um, the like the the previewability out of the experience and all of that. It seemed like this decoupling had served developers first, in content editors uh, second, and so um, that's that something that uh, I was curious to get your perspective on. Is that we had a lot of that previewability of content in the WordPress days, Ruby on Rails days. I mean, those are still those are still tools very much in use. And the whole monolithic server side rendered approach, like still very much a, a pattern used by many today. Um, but in this in this composable and decoupled world, um, how can like how how are we solving previewability and and making content uh, editing easy for for folks? Non-technical folks, particularly today. <laughs> like the true answer is like I don't know. Uh, <laughs> right. To yeah. give it a bit more context, I think like so. What WordPress and, and similar tools did was to have this like super clear content model, uh, but was also super constrained. So like basically posts and pages, and posts is kind of like it's a heading, it's some body text, maybe you have, have an embed of a YouTube video or something, but it's kind of like very constrained uh, and kind of easy to reason about for for most people the same with pages it's kind of like yeah you, you put some some stuff on it uh in, in wordpress it was mostly like or article stuff but it wasn't kind of like in this mm -hmm. channel like structure and you could kinda like have hierarchies and so on and then kind of like at some point we started to have like this pattern where with like block content and every landing page looked like like a section thing and still do i guess um, yep. yeah. <laughs> and we got tools like Squarespace and Wix and, and stuff that kind of catered around that that kind of like way of presenting stuff. Uh, and what they let you do was to just edit content kind of like in in the page, like what you see is what you get. Um, 
which also makes intuitive sense for most people. Like I changed the thing and now the thing changed. Um, and the trouble is, uh, or the challenge, I don't know, the problem challenge, uh, is as the web matured and became more kind of like om omnipresent in our lives, also the requ like requirements for it changed. Like now we expect kind of these immersive experiences with a lot of like state and carts and mm -hmm. whatnot. And the content should kind of get the same content should appear across different uh, kind of like views and, and in boxes sometimes and sometimes not. And then it's responsive and maybe it's in an app. Like the requirements change so much and the, the digital experience kind of like popped out of the post and the page. And what now? <laughs> like, what doesn't it even mean to preview something that can appear multiple places? Um, that's kind of like a hard problem, very exciting problem, but a hard problem. Yeah, and so um, I think b building on that scenario a bit, there's this concept of how how far. Um, okay, so I, I let me let me back up a minute. You're you're kind of setting us up to say like the content editors continue to want more and more and more generally. And I think that more is more flexibility and at a faster speed and, and, and all of that. Um, but do you, uh, do you feel like there's a, is there a point there because, um, or, or, or a limit. And the reason I ask that is I, 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 today have a lot of conversations around this idea of guardrails, of trying to find this balance between, for, for less technical editors to be able to move quickly, something tends to need a little bit more structure um, for, but, but then there's also that, um, they need that flexibility as well. So yeah, how, how are you thinking about that today? Yeah, it's funny not to say that because I, I rarely, Believe it or not, I really choose to <clears throat> go into discussions on on this Bluebird site called Twitter. Uh, but <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> I saw someone post on like an update to WordPress. Like, yeah, here's a new things, uh, the knobs and buttons and stuff. And it, I, I was triggered because I saw kind of like this model with kind of like radius uh, pixel controls for border radius. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. I saw uh, this. I was like, like, why on earth should we kind of like like require editors to make decisions about pixel pixels in 2022 when we have like design systems and tailwind and and whatnot like that seems like a concern that should be in code in the front end because it's impossible to take those decisions when you don't know all the screen sizes and, and stuff it seems like yeah the wrong place to have it uh to to my naive mind uh so i kind of like told twitter <laughs> and i got all of these reactions, of course, <laughs> um, and but most of them are like, yeah, like this feels wrong. When I do WordPress sites, I, I do a lot to kind of like remove those controls uh, because mm -hmm. it makes it super easy to 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 just break the design because you don't understand what you're changing uh, or kind of like the implication of it. And, and that takes us back to this question: like, do, what what kind of flexibility do editors actually need versus they feel they need or like maybe it's more about the feeling of having control um, than mm -hmm. actually solving kind of business needs or whatever. That is kind of like uh, the question for me. Um, and I think you can do both. I think you can give editors kind of like flexibility in kind of like expressing stuff they need to express but have kind of like the hard decisions been taken in code because we have all of these great, great tools now to do so. Um, so we, yeah, uh, that is kind of like, it's interesting to see WordPress uh, going more and more into becoming like this very bespoke page builder thing for a website. It's great for us, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's super interesting <laughs> to see it. Yeah, see that happen. so um, now, now like, with with all the the front end tooling that we have today you could you could drive every single design decision or or um yeah i mean now we can we can write css and javascript so technically your all of your styles could live in your content management system um I, at at sanity are you seeing um are you seeing some folks store 
uh, like st uh, traditional like style based values in the CMS or, or mostly keeping that in their design system and, and code? Yeah, we, we see both. Um, every time we see someone make make essentially the same controls as, as this WordPress example, we are like, should you be doing <laughs> that? Uh, um, and, and the reason is like, there are ways of doing that that isn't, that is kind of like sustainable. Um, but where you tread into dangerous territory is where you start to kind of like blend your content, which is kind of like the meaning and descriptions and all of that stuff with these presentation concerns. Because when you are redesigning your website, it's not an if, it's a when. And when you need that content elsewhere in an app or something, you are in trouble um, if you have mixed those things too tightly, right? Um, and that matters for kind of like the customers and businesses we work with, it, with, with our typically large complex things where the content is so close to the value change. Uh, chain. So you want to be very kind of like intentional with how you structure that stuff, uh, so you don't shoot yourself in the foot and regret it later. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. That that makes a ton <laughs> of sense. But I mean, in and I think in in theory, it's you say okay, keep all of that out of the CMS. But as a for, for um, overly complex sites, or even just as sites continue to grow, we say hey, we've got this hero component. And now we need this variation where the image is on the left. And so maybe I'm not controlling border radius, but I'm controlling layouts and, and permutations of a component. And so how do you generally recommend that folks structure um, variations like that? Yeah, it's like if you want to be super dogmatic, it's like, no, you shouldn't be. Like that should be a front end concern and you should ask the designer to be allowed to do that. Uh, and maybe the front end should just make that decision based on, on data and stuff. Like that, 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 that would be the ideal word, world, mm, but that, we also know that it doesn't work like that. Sometimes people just need to do stuff. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. So I would, I would recommend most like, okay, make a, make a, like a variation. Like if, if you need that control, maybe add a control as like primary and secondary or, or something. Try to kind of like make it a more general um, the cost is it's less obvious for people what is going to happen if they use the one or other setting, right? And that is where preview, for example, comes in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and not to be very product pitchy, but like what Sanity allows is to basically build in any type of preview or previews in the tool. So you can have multiple previews that shows you different settings or context for the content you are controlling. Um, or you can do stuff like just helpful labels on the fields to kind of like explain the implications of something. They're like all of these UX things you can do to, to just help editors make great decisions. Yeah, really, really interesting. And and also, um, so so at, the, at Stackbit doing something similar, we have the, I mean, the, the tool is, um, a, a big portion of the tool is that in context editing and all of that. So yeah, you can, <laughs> it's almost like because of that, that we, we have um, the, the flexibility is uh, unlimited and then it, it's up to the developer to find those right permutations. And I think um, it's really interesting that, that uh, you take the perspective of we need to lean on design, uh, design analytics feedback and a little bit more and, you know, be if the, the ideal state is could we be less concerned about which side the image is on and just put it somewhere and then see what happens and evolve over time. <laughs> yeah, um, and I also think it's may, maybe also matters like what what the content is. So like think about like a product title or description. Uh, for a lot of e-commerce sites, like that ends up in a lot of places. So editing that on, on the marketing landing page might have all of these implications you don't see if you do it kind of like in, in, in place. So maybe that belongs to kind of like a boring uh, text form thing and then, give, and then have some like previews or whatever to kind of like understand the implications. Yeah, and then you have like the, the, the marketing landing page where you iterate quickly and you learn and you need kind of like different ways of expressing layouts and so on. Maybe it matters less that that's, that is not kind of like an evergreen thing and you can throw it away and make a new and so on. And then, then we can allow ourselves for more controls like that because like it's, it's not yeah. meant to live 
in a lot of places uh, and so on. So there might be uh, kind of these like different decisions depending on what content it is you are actually editing. That's a great point. And I, I, I hadn't, I don't, I, I don't feel like I had, um, necessarily verbalize this before, but you're almost just suggesting that the tools like tools like Stackbit and these, um, and, and we're, we're playing in a different space, but just to kind of lump everybody together in, um, in say the site builder type tools that if we go back to the, the earlier part of our chat that um, WordPress had set this foundation for structured content. And in those days, in those early days, it was people were, were starting blog sites. So you didn't need control. You just needed, you needed to have a, be able to have a title and you had a body field, which could add some, you know, an image or, you know, a little bit of media in there. And, um, <clears throat> and that pattern, is definitely still relevant for, like you suggest, product pages or things that can be really structured and content editors, um, even non-technical people really understand. Like, it's, I feel like it's a lot easier for people to map in their mind. They're like, I changed this price, this thing on the website changes. But somewhere in the middle there, we evolved to say, okay, well, now we're going to take this, this like super structured thing and we're going to apply it to this super fluid and flexible system. And now you've got non-technical people who have to work in that system and they're totally lost because they're like, well, what is the, how am, if I do this, what happens over here? So yeah. yeah. That, so, so. And, and it's kind of like, it is because content has become like a complex field. Uh, and this is why I also react to like, should, should content editors uh, make decisions about pixels? Because just writing content for the web in itself is super hard. And it requires a lot of your brain space to kind of like make great decisions. <laughs> yes. So like how much should we kind of like expect from these people? And they might feel that they want to change the pixels because that's kind of like a creative outlet. But like in a, in a modern business, it's, it's, it should be like that. <laughs> yeah, fair, uh, fair, right. fair question for sure. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to um, transition in about uh, 10 minutes or so. So with these the um, 10 minutes we have left to um, to talk content, I wanted to shift and focus from uh, like the more traditional marketer or non-technical person editing content to how developers have edited content for the web. And um, let me just start here. So if you if you're gonna spin up your own website today or you have your own website today, so how do you how do you store content for that website? I, I'll give you one guess. <laughs> it's I well I I was okay I have two guesses I'm like which one should which one should I guess first all right um my I'll just I'll say is it insanity of course it is okay okay <laughs> um because I I that um and and which makes sense you're 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 using the product that you work for I what I've seen um and I think we've we've seen for years is that developers had um, have really attached themselves to Markdown. So as we were talking about like, okay, well, you writing is a whole thing. You want to focus on the writing. Um, and, and that kind of got the, it got all the, the weird curly braces and everything out of the way. And so you could just write um, and, and keep it simple. But we've also seen the, um, uh, the, the, the the needs for developers to be fluid as we've built out these front end systems that are component based and they're super rich and so we've had you know MDX come in and solve that problem, um, but but yeah I I think that um, what I'm what I'm trying to get at here is so do you do you feel like we are now okay this is you can answer this as sanity but also kind of um, interested in your perspective and the ecosystem a as a whole, should we be solving content editing for developers in the same way that we're solving content editing for the traditional marketer or less technical person? In a lot of ways, probably. Um, I think the whole markdown thing is super interesting. Uh, uh, full disclaimer, I wrote a lot about it in Smashing Magazine. Like, uh, I think it takes 30 minutes to get through that article. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry. Um, 
But yeah, um, I can very much relate to this. I was so deep into the the markdown overs uh, a couple of years ago. I had this like I, I used to be in the academy uh, doing kind of like research uh, in humanities, so I wrote a lot. Uh, and I had this whole pipeline where I wrote in Markdown in Sublime Text. Remember Sublime Text? Uh, oh, yeah. And it was translated to Latesh uh, with a live PDF mm -hmm. preview. It was pretty great. Two weeks, it actually worked. Um, so I, like, I, had, I have like so much muscle memory when it comes to Markdown. Uh, I can actually remember how to insert an image. Um, and so, so it's, it's very natural for me to do it. Um, when I started working for an agency who primarily did like websites, focused on UX and so on, I saw that like people whose job it is to work with content don't want to learn your markdown thing, especially not your specific specific kind of markdown implementation. And uh, they want don't want to learn these bespoke tags we have to make to kind of like actually make something more beyond kind of like an article with strong in italics. Um, and I want to go home from work and be with mm -hmm. their families and stuff. Um, and then we made kind of like these big editors that that you can like type, and that became Markdown. But then now we have the problem of like getting Markdown through the to, through the wires, and then we have to like break it down with with ATSs and and kind of like have this weird pipeline into your next site or whatever. And it's super brittle. Uh, and it breaks, and you can't really do stuff like controlling for lost links uh, unless you could crawl the whole site and stuff. There's a lot of things that Markdown isn't designed for that we are, need to solve now uh, that has like huge implications for developer experience. But it's so it, it's so beloved for us uh, that we kind of like, oh, but I want it to work. Uh, we will do all of this engineering to to break down MDX to to this uh, JSON structure and, and so on, which is it's fantastic. It's like I'm super impressed by that work. But it's like, are we solving the right problem here? And are we building tools using Markdown as default? Uh, and how is that kind of like affecting editors and so on in, in the in the second place? And how is that what the, is that doing to our empathy with the people we are solving problems for? That is my question. Uh, when it comes to this, but I'm like, if you like Markdown, like for sure, whatever floats your boat, right? <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I, I feel like you, yeah, you articulated <laughs> that um, much, much better than than I could. But I, I like what you said about yeah, we have a tendency to hang on to Markdown, and I, I feel very much that same way. It does feel good in some cases. But um, I think, and disclaimer, I do. Th I think MDX is a very cool piece of technology. It also feels like, like you're suggesting, we wanted to hang on to Markdown. We need to have this like rich um, editing, or it's not even an editing experience. It's just like, I, now I need to add interactivity in between and I need all this flexibility. And so, okay, I have, I have a theory that um, I, I want to get your take on, which is, I I think this is why this this problem that we're suggesting is why developers don't mind working with Notion in particular the the application Notion and it's it's like it feels and I think this is probably similar to Sanity's rich text editor you can tell me I don't I don't have a ton of experience with that but um, that I can move really fast I've got keyboard shortcuts but in the end, everything is and well, and I can add these interact interactive elements um, or different components, and and they're limited, and that's a different topic and a different challenge. Um, but under the hood, behind the scenes, we now now we get all that content from the API, and it's already structured, so we don't need curly braces or anything like that. We can work in this WYSIWYG rich environment and. Uh, it's just like it didn't start as a tool for developers, and it's kind of feeling like it's it's like a great CMS alternative. And I think it has something to do with that structured content. But that's just my theory. Now, what's your what what's your take on it? Yeah, it's so interesting. Like Notion, like if you actually like if you actually write a lot, like Notion is like oh, uh, <laughs> like it has become better. It's not, and, it's not the greatest for authoring. Yeah, yes. and I have to like it's it's so fantastically, incredibly hard to make a text editor. 
it is it's so complex and let alone a real-time text editor it's like um yes. having been privy to kind of like watching that work internally here i'm like in awe of anyone trying that <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, <laughs> incredibly hard so yeah we can complain about kind of like these tools not being feeling super smooth and so on uh but 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 yeah that being said uh, i think notion brought in this or really popularized this block content paradigm and it, it leverages markdown as shortcuts so if you have that muscle memory it's super easy to kind of like format your your article and it becomes mm -hmm. translated to kind of like uh, under the hood, like the adjacent based format, um, which is still a bit, it's, it's a bit easier to kind of like integrate that in, in modern tools. Uh, even on Notion's API is a bit kind of like convoluted when it comes to like blocks and fetching them and so on. But the API might, might uh, also be developed. But, uh, but yeah. Um, and but another thing I think also developers tend to have a bit less patience when stuff doesn't work. And your code editor is probably something that you can mostly trust. Like, like Wim won't quit on you. Actually, it's yeah. super hard to quit it. <laughs> no. Uh, and, and, <laughs> Good, yeah. and, and VS yeah, Code yeah. is slow. actually a decent electro, electron app, right? So I think we gravitate toward things we know we can trust and work and doesn't get in your way. Um, so yeah. Yeah, interesting. Okay, I, I I like that take as well. Um, okay, uh, one I, I'll just let um, let's ask one more open ended question, and that is, what's the what what is the future of content on the web? Where where do you think where do you think we're going as an an ecosystem? Like, what's the next big discovery? Um, or uh, you know, again, if you want to contextualize it to sanity, like, what is what does sanity see as the the future of content on the web? Ooh, um, I will probably say something cliche, but it's it's probably some different things. So, what we see at Sanity is kind of like this increased desire to to get control and and kind of like wherever you control your content, it should come with kind of like intentionality. Um, that's like that's why people gravitate towards such a content philosophy because like they want to have that control because they need this content to do a lot of different things. And you don't want your copy editors or editors to copy paste the same type of content everywhere and have all of these issues that comes from that. So that's kind of like one thing, one thing. And that aligns super well with our strategy, of course. Uh, but while this is going on, uh, there are some, some computer scientists in, in Google and, and other places who are working on these pretty incredible uh, machine learning models uh, that are able to produce fairly convincing texts from prompts. Um, and I think that whole paradigm is now starting to kind of like hit us. And it, that, I think that will kind of like be a lot of the conversation going forward um, and how to reason about it. Uh, like it's, I don't think it's clear to anyone uh, my colleague uh, said, like, it feels like the time when they introduced the the the, um, the camera, and you could take photos. It, it feels kind of like that because these models are so incredible in making stuff that is like, how? <laughs> um, oh, and is this real? Like, did I create this? Because I didn't yeah. create it. Can I can I take credit I, for it? You know, it, like, it is kind of like a synthesis of everything that was available from humanity to these models, right? What they are trained on. Which is, is mm -hmm. an own interesting subject, but but yeah, uh, this will for sure uh, enter like marketing and all of these things. If you can just prompt and get a like fairly reasonable uh, copy for your landing page, your SEO landing page, uh, who knows what where SEO is heading? Like, why should you spend all of those hours if you can just like do this? Um, and I think maybe we will see that humans and machines will collaborate more together uh, in this way uh, too. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, let's see. Exciting times ahead. Yeah, terrifying that's a, ahead. A terrifying. Yes, <laughs> yes, and yeah, and it's not just the. Um, um, it's it's not even really just about ownership for me. It's uh, two things that I'm I'm kind of interested in are, um, well, one just like how long is. It, not how long will we get to a point where we can prompt 
a machine and not and be satisfied, like a hundred percent satisfied with the output where that's what we publish. Um, but I'm at the same time, I'm thinking, well, okay. I, one of the things I really like to do on the web is write and teach people um, solutions to technical problems. Is that going away or is it just the skill becomes prompting the machine? And, and I, I don't, I don't know. I'm I'm super satisfied with the uh, add to function that Copilot can write for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I won't change it. Uh, but but That's yeah, true. It, it, it's like it's almost the same thing as with like should we give pixel control to editors? Is like who am I to 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 uh, to question the great machine when it comes to the optimal way of describing my my bike that I want to sell? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I think I think it, it will probably be kind of like I, I can get all of this stuff from the machine, and then I will just revise it and call it a day. Uh, and for my like creative, like outlet and the continued uh, exploration of what it means to be alive, that might be fully brain tissue uh, produced content. Uh, it's like we have a photocopier, but we still paint images or photos or, or so yeah I, I think we will continue to kind of like uh, straddle along and, and figure it out but uh but yeah i think there's a lot of day jobs that will be very dramatically changed by this and that's like that that's so i'm i'm in san francisco now i can already feel the the thought leadership the linkedin thought <laughs> leaderships seep in i'm sorry uh happening strike the last happening. sentence <laughs> <laughs> uh this was um this was amazing. We we went all the way from Microsoft front page to what does it mean to be alive? So I feel like we we had a successful um, deep dive there into content. Uh, but before before we go, I wanted to um, to pull in kind of a an alternate version of the last segment that we had in the, the previous season in Code Sandwich Hour, and that was these really quick questions that generally produced quick answers. Now I fell. Um, I hadn't quite figured out last season how to actually answer, ask questions that wouldn't prompt long answers. Uh, so I'm taking a new, a new approach here, and I've redesigned some of these questions. But I have nine of them, so um, you can pass on any of them. But uh, yeah, let's give it a shot. You ready? All right. I, I think so. Okay. Question number one: Tabs or spaces? Spaces. Okay. How many? How many spaces? Depends on the programming language, but JavaScript, uh, I guess two. Okay. Okay. I'll yeah. Split screen. No argument. Yeah. <laughs> Question number two: um, the most interesting location you've been when you've been writing code? In a plane. Mm, okay. Did you have? Uh, I guess you can, you, you can, no, yeah, alternate or, or follow-up question. Were you connected to Wi-Fi at the time or were you doing this all? Barely. Locally? <laughs> okay. I feel like that is a huge accomplishment because I feel like I'm, I'm between Google and the code all the time. That's great. Okay. Question number three. Um, the, what is the, the open source product, project that mm, you either use the most or that you appreciate the most? Like outside of our own stuff, yeah, yeah. I think the uh, the honest answer is probably next JS. Okay, I'll take it. Number four, what was the? I can't remember. If we, did we touch on this? The first programming language that you learned? I will say HTML. Yes, I was hoping that's that would be your answer. <laughs> but it's not true. It's probably basic. When I okay, I put okay. long back. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, number five or number five? Yes. Okay. The now switching switching from uh, technical questions. Um, we'll be back. Uh, question number five is: What was the last the last musical album you listened to all the way through, front to back? Uh, it was an uh, artist called Vardruna. Which I was at the concert on Tuesday. Uh, it's kind of like it's the folks behind the 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 series Vikings, or the folks who made the music for Vikings. Oh, okay. Um, 
so yeah, Valdruna, check it out. Mm, what what style is it? Is it like um, uh, I don't even know how to guess? It's like quotation marks Viking music. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number six. What what's your most enjoyable non tech activity? What are you doing when you're not writing code? It's probably hiking out, outdoors. Okay. Number seven, <laughs> I just wrote React or literally anything else. React is a hot <laughs> button topic right now. Are you on the React train or are you not on the React train? It's my job to be on the React train, but uh, <laughs> a, also on other things. Answer. It's like, it's all JavaScript. Like I tend to it's say like, job. It is it is all vanilla JavaScript at the end of it, right? It's yes, or is, yes. Or it assembly. Is. Yeah. I don't know. Like whatever it gets compiled to doesn't well, matter. Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I like I like how you turn that one around. That's that's good. All right. Number eight is what is the best career advice or best the best advice you have received throughout your career? The best advice. Um I guess take the job <laughs> um, that I have now. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's great. That's why that's why you are where you are. Not very useful for others, but yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Okay, last one, number nine, and this is a, a shorter version of the one that I uh, one that I loved to ask that that people really enjoyed last year, which was, you can have lunch with anybody, any human who is alive or not alive. Uh, who would it be? That's incredibly hard. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, no, I used to. I last year I asked this as a a four part question, and it got really intricate, and it took a lot of time. <laughs> so, so like, well, let's just name the person, and we'll stop. We'll stop. There. Like, you can change history literally with with, with this, or can you? Is it if I choose, like if, mm. I, if I take like a late person, uh, am I going back, or, or are they coming here? They're coming forward. Yeah. So we're not, okay. um, this is just like a moment in current time. We're not, uh, we can, we can resurrect people, but we're, we can't change history in this scenario. <clears throat> but like to stay a bit on, on brand, I think, uh, I would love to have a, a luncheon with, with John Gruber, the creator of Markdown and have like a serious conversation. That's a, that's a great choice. Yeah. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks, Knut. This this was amazing and being a great sport on these um, these quick questions. Yeah. But really, I really loved um, going going deep on content content editing. This was yeah. I feel like we talked about a lot. Of course, so much more to um, to continue these conversations with. Now, before you go, um, if, please tell listeners and, and viewers uh, how to get in touch with you, and and feel free to take a minute to plug anything else that you're currently working on. For sure. Um... Like, I don't know how long it was, like 27. Like, I chose to, like, I was early on Twitter, chose the most useless handle there is, like K M E L V E. Try and, like, do try and find me. I, I like, who knows how long we are all going to be on Twitter. But, uh, but yeah, um, you can also go to, to sanity.io uh, and find us there. Uh, try it out. Um, it's it's great, and we're working on a really cool update for the Santa Studio. Uh, it's out in the release candidate now, and it will change your life. So try it out. I'm sold. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's it for this show. Thank you all for your support, for being here. These shows are recorded live on the first and third Thursdays of each month at 1 p.m. Eastern Time in the United States, which is 5 p.m. GMT. The shows are then later syndicated on CFD.dev and YouTube as videos, and then also in audio format wherever you happen to find your podcasts. We'll be back in two weeks with Stephanie Eccles, and we're going to be talking about modern CSS and how it's not really as scary as it might seem. That'll be, that'll be a fun chat. But uh, until then, from all of us at CFE.dev, thank you for joining us for this show, and we will see you next time.